Given the choice between protecting a tree or cutting it down to warm his home, the man hired to protect the tree is likely to reach for his ax. Vicki Moretzky wouldn't blame him. Or so reads the opening line of a recent magazine article about Professor Moretzky's work and research in Central Asia. Vicki is an associate professor in the IU School of Public and Environmental Affairs. And while we've interviewed a diverse group of people for our Cyber Focus episodes, I guarantee you, Vicki, you are the first one with a PhD in wildlife <laughs> ecology. Thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Your, your wildlife ecology is your background. Your bio reads conservation biologist. That's correct. What, what is that? What are your areas of research? Conservation biology is a field that was invented to solve a problem that biologists who would usually sort of live in their ivory towers <laughs> and gaze out across their remote pristine study areas were finding their remote pristine study areas surrounded, heaven forbid, by people oh. and, and <laughs> things related to people and were discovering that species were disappearing, resources were being used in unsustainable fashions and conservation biology really is a field that was created to respond to a need to get out of the ivory tower and to begin to understand how we continue to use things while continue to protect things and particularly protecting living resources. So the diversity of life on earth is the major focus of uh, conservation biology. So how does a nice conservation biologist like you end up in Central Asia? I was looking for an opportunity to explore some of the conservation issues that are not easily reached. I had a little bit of background in Russia and I've been given the opportunity because of some SPIA contacts to spend a little bit of time in Azerbaijan which is in the sort of larger picture of Central Asia. It's actually over by the Caspian Sea so it's kind of a gateway between Europe on the one hand and Central Asia on the other and I'd spent some time there helping one of the universities with a program they had and had had a chance to see a little bit of the impact of the Soviet Union era on conservation there and had some contacts who could tell me a little bit about whether or not it would be possible to travel in Central Asia, in the stands, if mm -hmm. you will. Well, um, what are some of the, sorry, the, uh, the impact of the post-Soviet era, such as? Well, during the Soviet times, Moscow was the center of the universe, and the edges of the universe were the edges of the Soviet Union and its satellites. So these countries, during that period, basically didn't see beyond the boundaries of that in, in, the term, in terms of news, in terms of language, in terms of trade, in terms of ideas. The world ended where the edges of the interests of the Soviet Union ended. And furthermore, the satellite states, the, the non-Russia parts of the Soviet Union, were pretty much the, the hands and the back of the Soviet Union. They were the places where the Soviet Union put dirty technology that they didn't want causing problems at home where the world was focused. Um, and they were not places where innovation or creativity or anything that could be problematical was in any way fostered or supported. If, if you got to thinking that you knew how to do something better, at best, you might be picked out for hand training and sent back to mm -hmm. Moscow to be trained there and maybe used there. Uh, possibly sent back to your home country, but not if you were going to cause problems in any way there. So there's a, a huge sort of a vacuum where all of the kind of let's pick ourselves up and move ourselves forward kinds of impulses should be. On the other hand, they were very good about extending their conservation system. The problem there is they were really super, some of the best in the world really, at saying, you know, we need, we need an area of this kind of habitat. We don't have any of that protected. We need to designate some of that. But the impetus there was for ecological research, to sort of lock things up and have research kinds of playgrounds almost, and, and these were not parks. These were not places people could go to. Oh, people okay. really weren't into that anyway, but they were also in remote places very often, far from anywhere that it was easy to get to. And unless you were a research scientist on paper, you couldn't get in. 
if you were a party person, you could probably get in. But, <laughs> but by which I mean a communist party, right. but not otherwise. So compare conservation as we might know it here in the U.S. to conservation activity and efforts that you were seeing. A lot of the conservation that we've had in the U.S., and, and we can blame Teddy Roosevelt, bless his heart, for this, um, is based on things like national parks, where mm -hmm. things were protected, but they were also protected in a way that helps to do education, mm -hmm. that helps to do recreation, that brings the hearts and minds of the people into this idea of protected areas, which are, if not open for you know timber and all of the rest, at least open to the people, and that brings the people along with it. It makes the American public part of our conservation landscape. Because you're missing that link to the public, and for a lot of people in these countries, it would be a weird link. This is not what they think about for recreation, and they don't necessarily have a lot of either free time or certainly any free money. A lot mm. of these people are struggling hard to feed their families and to keep the heat going in their homes. And so there is no particular sense. They know about these protected areas, and they have no sense of involvement in them and no sense of why they're good things. There's very little tourism to these countries, so these areas aren't necessarily bringing in much in that respect. And so except for a few who are interested in this area because, frankly, they're a little odd in their own <laughs> cultures, there just, there just isn't that level of involvement. Hmm. So I don't take a hiking vacation into the mountains. And... If you're young and westernized, mm. you might. But otherwise, your idea of a vacation is much more to find someplace warm, probably on a beach someplace, maybe along the Black Sea, um, and sit quietly, possibly while consuming medicinal quantities of, <laughs> of something of local production. <laughs> and that, you know, we, there are plenty of people here who do the same thing. Folks in Florida can talk to you about this kind of vacation endlessly, but that tends to be much more of what's going on. Or you go down to the Mediterranean. No, you okay. leave the country and you head, but it's still sort of the idea of warmth and relaxation. And if you have disposable income, you spend it shopping. Mm -hmm. You don't spend it, you know, in a little cottage with no running water, admiring the scenery <laughs> and diverse, bizarre wildlife. Interesting. So, so, so um, the ecotourism industry that's been so successful in Puerto Rico and Brazil, do, do, do these entrepreneurs have a chance of looking into Central Asia and some of these beautiful areas that exist? There's a little bit of extreme sorts of skiing. There's a, there is the very beginnings of a homegrown uh, ecotourism industry where you can stay in local households but these are very, very tiny things. They have very low capacity. The road structures in these countries tend to be underdeveloped. If you want to get, for example, up into the mountains of Kyrgyzstan, and, and I strongly recommend it from an aesthetic standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, it's going to involve long drives. It's not necessarily the case that these roads will be open in the wintertime. Uh, there are no five-star hotels. Uh, everything is still pretty much Soviet era for the most part. And the people are very uneducated in the whole notion of what it would mean to have a green stay, for example. Um, the diet isn't richly diverse. The markets aren't open, so if you wanted to wine and dine people well, serving the Persian peaches, for example, it's not clear that it would be at all easy to get Persian peaches in. They come from the other side of borders that are hotly contested. Yeah. So in that respect, it's for the adventuresome, yes, there's the beginnings of things. So people who wanted to start slow and sort of leverage some of the, the slow development that's going on, there are definitely opportunities. But they have to be flexible people, mm -hmm. and they have to be inventive. Hmm. I realize I've been focusing, because of my question about uh, ecotourism, on vacationers who obviously have expendable income. So we're probably talking about international travelers coming in to visit these areas. Let's talk more about the people that are living within these areas. That opening uh, quote that we started with from the magazine article where you say you wouldn't blame the man hired to protect a tree to, uh, for picking up his axe. Let's, let's talk about that man for a minute. First of all, who's, protect, who's hired to protect a tree or you know, <laughs> what's that all about? And then you, conservationist biologist, saying you wouldn't blame him. What's that? 
conservation biology was criticized for many years for leaving people out of the picture. It's a discipline that was invented because people were seen as the problem. Mm -hmm. And it took conservation biology a long time to begin to understand what it means that people must be part of the solution. And, and not just the conservation <laughs> biologists, but all of the rest of the world too, because there aren't very many of us and there's an awful lot of the rest of y'all. <laughs> so, so that part of things now is, is becoming much more a part of conservation biology. And, and one of the things that's becoming a really obvious axiom of the business is that you can't ask people to protect things when they're starving particularly if it's something that might feed them. That expecting people not to put their children first, not to put their loved ones first, is, is not only uneducated, it's, it's in some sense unethical. Our frame of ethics of necessity includes the whole planet, and, mm -hmm. and for very good reasons. We need the whole planet to keep working if we're going to continue in, in our own species. But the idea that you would hire someone in a national park and expect them to bar the doors to the national park or the, the national research area, that the Zapovidniki, which the, the Russians set up, uh, and expect them to be able to continue to do that when their salary isn't enough to feed themselves and a partner, never mind themselves and a spouse and children mm -hmm. and livestock, or that they would not occasionally let their horses and cows graze on that area when there is absolutely no other place that they're allowed to do that. Those kinds of ideas simply aren't useful to anyone. And so beginning to understand what drives people, the fact that these research natural areas are still on the maps, still understood, and still largely intact is an amazing testament to the fact that these people will pick up an ax to, to cut down a tree but not typically to cut down all of the trees. Mm. One of the things that most of these countries are very, very short on is hard currency that isn't, you know, sort of the paper that their own country has, but outside currency that's got real worth. These are the countries where apples began, where walnuts began, mm. where a whole host of the fruits and nuts that we're used to. And what we tend to forget is that fruit woods and nut woods tend to be very valuable hardwoods in and of themselves. You can cut these trees down and get lots of money for them on the open market. And so the fact that these things have got commercial value and yet they still exist at all is, is really a strong testament to the, the sense of worth that these people have of these things for their own country, mm -hmm. for their own people. If they need some of them for heat, that's got to be understandable. If it isn't understandable, we haven't understood anything that's, that's worth pursuing, really. And that's another aspect of, of what anyone moving into this area has to understand, is that the economy in these places, when the Soviet Union moved out, it wasn't with this nice, slow transition where you do capacity building and governance building. These were countries that had been told that their governance was none of their business that their business structure was going to be imposed from outside. And when the Iron Curtain went down and the wall went down, the Russians folded their suitcases and disappeared in the night. And that was it. It was almost literally from one day to the next that all of their business relationships were cut, all of their subsidies were cut. In a city in most of these countries, the central heating is central to the town. Oh it's not central goodness. to your building. There is a work? steam works somewhere in town, and all of the major streets have these enormous steam pipes moving through them that carry the steam. These are countries that have winter that's seven months out of right. the year, some of them. These enormous, well-insulated steam pipes that carry the steam all the way through the place. Hmm. If the government falls apart and the economy falls apart, it's a whole different thing than what we think about here. It's not every person for yourself in terms of keeping the heat on in your building unless you want to go build a small hut someplace which frankly might be easier to heat right. than trying to get municipal <laughs> steam plants back online. It's really a, a very different kind of a situation Absolutely. than you know the kind of thing where we think of okay so we've been helping this country and we want to stop doing that slowly we're going to put advisors in place. None of that. It, it, it just was gone. Wow.
very different environment. So. I, I think that our viewers will appreciate your, your sensitivity to that, that tension that exists between people needs and environmental needs and, and the crossover there. If we have um, a, a business person who's thinking about some sort of business venture and a presence in Central Asia, but still wants to be mindful of conservation. What's your advice for that business? It depends a lot on which one of the countries they're going into because at this point they, they vary hugely. Um, we've got countries like Kazakhstan which has a lot of oil and gas wealth and so economically they're on a somewhat better footing and they can afford to think a little bit about conservation but because it's a new and different thing still not so very much. But because there's more money there, there's more options for doing things in a green way. And there are going to be some businesses, everybody's getting more involved in green energy and all of these other things. These countries are backed right up against China, which for all its, its faults, and it certainly has them, is actually fairly interested in green energy and green infrastructure hmm. because they see the problems that they're having in China. So. They, there are potentials for partnerships there. China's not too pleased about America as a military presence, but it's not clear at all that they're unhappy about America as an economic presence. They're much more interested in, in doing large-scale trade back and forth to be able to use the backside of China also as a route to mm -hmm. economic success, not just the ocean side of China. So in that respect, there are possibilities for beginning to become part of a larger landscape that's working out there. And the sustainability aspects, sort of the sustainable lifestyle things, are probably the areas where there's the most immediate interest. Ecotourism can be part of that simply because it's part of an economic engine and it taps into a fairly wealthy demographic mm -hmm. that's always attractive. But in terms of anything that's going to deal with local people, then things like intelligent agriculture would be a great place to start. There's very good fruit production in parts of, for example, Kyrgyzstan. There's not even refrigeration in many of these places. There's not juice production. If you buy juice off the shelf in Kyrgyzstan, there's a good chance it comes from Kazakhstan because there simply has not been any business development and people don't have even the basic beginnings of understandings of how business works, mm. of how to make, they weren't permitted to make contacts with the West for so many years. Mm -hmm. And now they're beginning to speak English more. That, I mean, that was the other problem. Mm -hmm. They not only weren't allowed, they didn't have the means. Yeah. Um, you have to begin to think about the fact that these countries are beginning to become more nationalistic in terms of their own languages. Mm -hmm. Russian has been a common language in this region for a long time, and it will still work fine for most businesses. But most of these languages are moving over fairly rapidly to their own languages. If you're going to work in government, there are minimum requirements. And, I mean, they had to make a law to do this because in some countries, their own languages were not favored at all. Mm -hmm. People had no fluency in what should have been their native language. But mm. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan both have requirements, I believe Uzbekistan now does as well, that if you work for the government, you're increasingly going to work in your native tongue and you need fluency in your native tongue. So while Russian would get you by initially, now there's going to be, at least some of the paperwork requirements are going to be in languages that are more difficult. The good side is everybody's teaching English a lot more. And that's good for conservation as well because it opens the door to the English textbook. Not so many textbooks on conservation biology in Uzbek. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not very many finance books in Uzbek right. either or business textbooks. So the fact that English is, is making a better penetration allows that kind of education to begin to come up and then once people have got the English, then you have native people who know what's going mm -hmm. on, who can write the Uzbek textbooks or the Kazakh textbooks. Mm -hmm. So um, you can sort of use English as, as a pass-through. And I don't think English is going to go away anytime soon. So I, the business community increasingly has opportunities to work with local people who can facilitate the paperwork process and the business process. So there is business opportunity there. It the, may not be immediately in ecotourism. It might yeah. be business education for a while. Absolutely. And, and the, the ag area is certainly one that's, that's possible, but the sustainable living kinds of things as well. 
anything that's energy efficient and less expensive because it's energy efficient is, is likely to be something that's worthwhile. Uh, people who know hydroelectric will be of interest in Kyrgyzstan where they are, are building uh, hydroelectric dams still. Uh, people who know about you know do, building good, well-insulated, relatively energy neutral housing in cold climates, certainly a great interest. Great. So. Great tips, great, great uh, perspective on opportunities that might exist. Thank you so much for your time It's, it's today. been great fun. I really oh, appreciate good. it. I'm so glad. <laughs> I know if nothing else, I leave today with a much deeper appreciation of my national parks. Thank you for joining us.